Hi there everyone. One of the things they have a lot of here at the Royal Society is very impressive busts. This is one of them. This is George III. Is that right, Keith? That's right, yes. But they're actually sculptures of scientists all through the building. We're going to show you some of them now. And then at the end, we're going to have a very small twist for you. A very small twist. Very small. But first of all, we're going to start over there because I can already see one of the sculptures. It's a very famous scientist. Let's go see him. Let's go. All right, Keith, shall we give people a few seconds to see if they can figure it out? He looks a bit different to what he normally looks like here. Quite Roman, quite noble. Yeah. Oh, there's a clue. Yeah, look at that. A bit spacey. We've got some yeah. planets. Yep. Got some orbits. Oh, hang we on. We have a name. There's an even bigger clue. It's Isaac Newton. It's quite a nice one, this one, Keith. Is it, is it a particularly important or valuable sculpture? Is it? Were there lots of sculptures of Newton? Well, there, there were a few, uh, but this is, I think, one of the nicer ones from the period. There's like a funny mark on his nose. Did something break? It's been it? broken, yeah. I mean, one of the things that happens to sculptures quite a lot is that they do tend to tip over if people are careless, and the nose is very often the thing that gets damaged. He did have quite a big nose, didn't he? But uh, let he who is without sin cast, well, <laughs> cast the yeah, first stone. Yeah, we, we can't talk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Doesn't stop there, though. Let's go and have a look in this room. This room is full of sculptures. Here's another one. I quite like the idea of people taking a few seconds to guess. This is a very, very famous scientist. What do you think, people? Any ideas? There's no clues on this one. It's all clean at the base, but who's this, Keith? Michael Faraday, of Michael course. Michael Faraday. Mr. Electricity, isn't he? He looks kind of like Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> well, it's, it's in that uh, period, slightly later, but, but, you know, early 19th century, this one. It's these sideburns, I think, mm. that do it. Yeah, it's quite a, quite a young Faraday, then. Look at this, Keith. This is, this is science's greatest hits. It is. I think everyone is going to know who this one is immediately because this is his classic look. Yeah, the beard and brows are a bit of a giveaway there, aren't they? Charles Darwin, of course. Very nice. Here's something we don't see a lot of at the Royal Society, but we are starting to see more. We've done a yes. video previously about this. We have a woman. Mm -hmm. We have Mary Somerville. By Francis Chantry. Chantry, although he was a sculptor, also a fellow of the Royal Society. Okay. So Mary Somerville was not a fellow of the Royal Society, though she probably should have been. Probably, yes. Very famous mathematician. But if we, is Chantry written on the back here? Yeah, let's just turn. Here's something you don't do often. We're going to have a look at the back here because we can see Sir F. Chantry. And Chantry was big hitter of sculpting. Yeah, he's one of the, the great artists of, of this period, early 19th century, early to mid. So Keith, Chantry was not a scientist, yet was made a fellow. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe Chantry was made a fellow so they could get mates rates on the sculptures or was he worthy of a that they, they got mates rates on this one actually yes they did did they but you could um uh, become a fellow of the royal society this period uh, if you had a, a general interest in science quite often artists and other kinds of people did because they were technically inclined therefore for work in sculpture you might need to know a bit about materials or a bit about engineering for example so it didn't hurt to have people like this within the royal society. So this is one of my favourite scientists and at the Royal Society he's a really big deal and in Australia where I'm from he's a really big deal but I think not enough people know who he is. This is Joseph Banks, very long serving president of the Royal Society, a botanist. He was on the Australian five dollar note when I was growing up but this is another Chantry sculpture. If you don't believe me let's have a look at the let's back. Let's turn it. Here we go. The Right Honourable Sir Joseph Banks baronet and of course president of the Royal Society presented to the Royal Society by here he is Francis Chantry I'm assuming that means sculptor so he sculpted this bust in 1819 mm. but I promised you a small twist let's go and look at something else so here are two more really big names of science but these busts Keith they're a bit smaller aren't they what's tell me about what's going on here first of all who are these people well we have here James Watt and John Dalton, so two big name scientists. Why are these so small? Well, they're miniaturized versions of full sized busts by Francis Chantry. And in order to get from one of those large sculptures to this, well, you would need James Watt, in fact, because he's one of the people who adapted a pantograph style technology. And this is how you could reduce engineering drawings by a drawing machine or expand them as you saw fit. But what James Watt was interested in was extending that to three-dimensional objects. In Watt's attic workshop 
in Birmingham. He had machines to do exactly this, so three-dimensional objects. And I don't know if you can read the back here in the same way as we did with the, the, the large bus. It says Chantry. Mm -hmm. So Chantry is a sculptor. Of course. Yeah. And then some fact or some um, title or something. It, it says Cheverton. It says Cheverton underneath that, yes. Mm. So Benjamin Cheverton took that idea of three-dimensional uh, reduction and made a business out of it. He created a machine where you could take a original, run a pointer over it, and it would control a cutting tool to make a smaller version of whatever it was that you wanted. And Cheverton's miniature sculptures like this, and these are in ivory, are really sought after. Cheverton actually exhibited at the Great Exhibition in 1851, uh, and he won a gold medal for producing these uh, with his uh, uh, sculpture machine. Keith, I'm not sure he'd get a gold medal these days for using ivory though. That's a bit of a no-no, isn't it? It is these days. And of course, if you're in the museum world and you want to send things overseas for exhibition, let's say, there's a whole mass of paperwork you have to go through to, to uh, show ivory and take it through customs and so on. So yeah, these days, uh, a big no-no. So there we go. Busts of all shapes and sizes here at the Royal Society, but all of them really interesting. And of course, you can come here sometime if you like and see these for yourself. Does it make a difference whose picture's on the wall or are they just pictures on a wall? Does it matter? I think it does matter. I think they're stories. And certainly when I walk around buildings um, like the Royal Society or even when I'm at work at UCL, I use the decorations that are around the building to tell stories about the place. And if you don't have a good diverse range of people who've been involved, you, you don't even get the opportunity to tell their stories. They get left behind.